first of all, thank you so much for waiting this long. Uh, thank you for your patience and thank you for uh, coming to our event in a Saturday. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Seda Altan and I'm the director of Our Istanbul. It is uh, truly a great pleasure uh, that I'm uh, able to moderate uh, today's Our own Saturday conference hosting Ute Schneider. Um, Ute Schneider, uh, architect, urban designer, and the partner of KS Christianze Architects and Planners. Um, she'll be joining us today from uh, VN. Uh, for the ones who join Jumartis Hours, uh, our own Saturday conference for the first time, I'd like to give a little background on our Istanbul. Uh, the name of our stands for Architecture and Urbanism Research Academy. Uh, our Istanbul uh, established in 2017 as a nonprofit organization. Although we are organizing many public events, uh, the main focus of the academy is to be a think tank for young architects and designers with its certificate program. And in four years time, our program became a bridge of experimentation and research. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank our sponsor of this special event, Arginolu and Çalışlar Architects founded by Kerem Arginoğlu and Hasan Çalışlar. Uh, Kerem Arginoğlu, actually, uh, he's here with us today. Um, and until today, they have made a great contribution in many valuable ways by devoting their time and sharing their knowledge. Uh, we feel very lucky to have them as our friends. Uh, with no further ado, um, I'd like to introduce today's guest, Professor Ute Schneider. Uh, Uta Schneider studied architecture at the universities in Constance, Stuttgart, Karlsruhe, and TU Delft. After being trained as a carpenter and having gained several years of experience as an interior designer, she graduate, graduated at the University of Stuttgart in architecture and urban planning in 1998. She worked in various German and Dutch internationally operating architectural offices. In 1998, together with three partners, uh, she founded the architectural practice Zipper Space Works in Stuttgart with a focus on working on various disciplines at the intersection of urban planning, architecture, exhibition design, product design through the graphic and web design. In 2002, she founded her own office, UMA Office. In 2003, Ute Schneider started her collaboration with KCAP, uh, which is uh, KS Christianze Architects and Planners, from 2006 six, on in the uh, newly opened Swiss branch in Zurich and took over the directorship there in 2009. She became a partner of KCAP in 2016. In this position, she is co-responsible for management of the office and in charge of the coordination of KCAP Zurich projects spanning from architecture and urban planning to the design and development of master plans and transformation strategies in various scales and contexts. Among a wide variety of projects, uh, she focuses on transport oriented developments like diverse station precincts and airport city developments. Teaching and research are in the DNA of KCAP and at the center of Ute Schneider's work. In 2020, uh, she has been appointed professor at the Vienna University of Technology, assigned to the Institute, Institute of Urban Design and Landscape Architecture. Prior to that, she supervised design studios with integration of urban planning at the University of Liechtenstein from 2012 uh, to 2018. In 2018, she, um, she held a visiting professorship, professorship at the TU Munich. Throughout her years of experience, uh, Ute Schneider was involved in various exhibitions and publications of KCAP. She is a frequent lecturer and a valued member of a wide range of international selection commissions, juries, and advisory boards. Um, so that's about all uh, from now. Um, Right now, I will uh, thank, of course, thank Ute Schneider for being here with us. Um, and I will uh, stop sharing my screen and leave the floor to Ute. Ute, thank you for coming again. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you very much for this extensive um, 
and very complete uh, introduction. Um, nice to be there, would be much nicer to be there in person, but yeah, we soon maybe again. And I had also the chance to visit Istanbul some years ago and it's really a lovely city. But what I want to try to, to talk about today is uh, say like uh, announce to reactivate and adaptive reuse, let's say working from the status quo, but also working with, let's say with a, with a heritage that is on site, that uh, regeneration and requalification of brownfields and heritage buildings. So for us as KCP, um, let's say the, the findings on site are really crucial. And I think you also in Istanbul, uh, you have, and also in our country, you have a lot of this kind of sites um, and then also good examples as some of them kind of are sure. Um, let's say these brownfield sites and in post-industrial areas have a lot of opportunities and also um, the space and also the heritage and the soul of a place, like I call it very often, um, to, to really create um, something very special. We call them also the seedbed of urbanity because there is already so much of traces, um, let's say, of buildings, but also um, open fields, green fields, but also, for instance, this kind of rails you see here on the ground um, that are really because of the size, but because of also the usage and the proximity to city and also infrastructure have a huge potential. But I'd like to discuss, I'd like to discuss this kind of um, points along four topics. One is transformation of the status quo, like I already started with. Um, second, traces of identity and the importance of all the new buildings, but also other kind of heritage on the site. Um, then the fourth one, facts on the ground and placemaking, what is necessary to create, let's say, a place, a new place or transformation of place. And the last one with some examples, also a master plan and a flexible framework, because we work always, and let's say we don't like so much this notion of a master plan, because we think you cannot define an area 100% in advance, so we... We always define flexible frameworks um, within a, with, uh, together with a rule set um, and can transform over time and also adapt to certain kind of changes um, and circumstances. What we face at the moment quite heavily kind of to be capable to adapt to a situation um, like uh, the pandemic um, and a plan needs to do that as well. Um, we also kind of <clears throat> Call this very often City as Loft. Uh, I started to, to work with KCP with an exhibition, City as Loft. Um, um, he case worked then later on a, together with Martina Baum on a uh, on a research project, her PhD um, about the City as Loft, where also certain sites like, for instance, the Bilge University in Istanbul is part of um, and stresses this kind of question about adaptive reuse, resource, sustainable development um, among these sites. And they are belonging, let's say, harbor sites, transformation sites, um, industrial heritage sites, but also kind of military kind of sites um, um, are very often the fields of our work. Um, this is one, uh, let's say, um, project, um, a very early one KCP was working uh, on when case, case Christian Sher, um, left Ome and started his own office uh, in 89. Um, this was a project uh, we got uh, from the city of Rotterdam for an inner city harbor area. So the harbor moved constantly outside of the city. And this is very close to the market, uh, to the new market hall that is on the left-hand side, so to say, um, and directly at the mass. Um, that was how this site looked like when we started kind of uh, to work on that. Um, it was a completely monofunctional kind of office uh, island. Um, therefore also social control wise, not very attractive. And the question was to, intensify and also intensify and um, with a radical mix of uses. So next to the office spaces, um, there should be kind of um, residential towers kind of possible. And we developed therefore um, quite an open framework as well, kind of you see certain kind of different infos so that can um, grow, that this island can grow incremental wise over time. Um, the rule set was based on certain kind of slenderness of the towers kind of to keep open the view lines. Um, but also on incentives to say that a developer could build a bit more, let's say got, that the tower could be a bit higher, but you have to kind of provide really public attractive program um, on grade level, or you have to really qualify the public space um, because the island I social later some photographs was not that attractive at that time and was for, especially had a problem with social control um, and social uh, security. Um, 
we work very often about these four generators of diversity, kind of based on Jane Jacobs, kind of to really look for mixed use um, and a really a radical mixed use in the program, no monofunctional kind of kind of uh, areas. And short blocks, the permeability, a porosity on grade level, kind of that um, also differentiation between different kind of hi uh, hierarchies of public space can appear. Then buildings of raised ages and states of repair, that's already kind of what I talked earlier about, this identity of a place and also the growing process and defining, so to say, growing versus of an area transformation process and not something from scratch. Um, and a certain kind of density, that we always very often call a critical mass. But this is not only a density within kind of um, um, mass, let's say in square meters, I'm our volume, but especially also a density and intensity in relation to program and also so differentiation between different kinds of social groups. And this was how the, how the island looked like um, before. Let's say I used to work there at that time in Nordling Sriedijk office for quite a while, all over four years. And our entrance was here, um, let's say, if you see, can you see my mouse, by the way? Can you see my the, the, yes, this flash? Yes, yes. Uh, yes so that was see. the entrance, and you see, let's say, the great levels of um, of this island at the time. Kind of a lot of garage uh, porches, kind of entrances, um, very unattractive, no really public attractive program. Some entrances, and there was also policy at the time. We were never allowed to leave when we were working late on a competition. The the off single, so we had to go always the last two together. Um, for, in, for security reasons. And this is how this grade level um, now looks like. So after having a densification of this kind of residential program, but also a densification of more people living there and also living all over the day, let's say about a 16, 18 hour period of the time of the day, um, the, there are people on street. And you see here much more light um, green, but also let's say here, a swimming hotel down here, galleries, um, restaurants, but also shops. Um, but these shops also only come, let's say, if you have a certain critical mass of people and also residential program there. Um, plus, it was also another something I think we need to learn, let's say, everywhere where we built in cities, kind of monofunctional areas are always tricky because they don't create over an, a bigger period of time, let's say, the demand for a lot of services that create this kind of vibrancy and urbanity and also services kind of that are needed. Next topic, traces of identity, old and new buildings. Um, that I mentioned already um, uh, along another project that is the Oostelijke Handelskade in Amsterdam. Uh, KCP worked as an urban planner, but also as an architect for a dock, um, dock area close to the central station and the city center um, and the, the gateway, so to say, to the harbor islands, uh, eastern harbor island of Bornis, Bornburg and Karnes M. And you see here on top, let's say a bit uh, the morphology and also in the images kind of this kind of juxtaposition of old and new buildings. Um, and we try to keep as much as possible of the old heritage there as well. And we were very often kind of, especially when we started in Switzerland, I was asked kind of whether this is a kind of a romant a romanticism. Um, this is not at all romanticism. This is really something um, we learned and I also saw um, personally very, very strongly. I used to study, like uh, Sida uh, Adana said, in Stuttgart, um, most of my studies, and also had office there, um, and spent also quite a while in Rotterdam. Um, and both cities were, after the Second World War, kind of completely damaged in their city center, and they only had one church um, standing there. One was the Lauenskerk in Rotterdam and the Stiftskirche in, in Stuttgart, and they needed both um, more or less 50 years to get back to a certain urban vibrancy. Um, and this is crucial um, for that reason. So that is, to, so to say, to, to, to de define a, a place to, to really get to a vibrancy and also a kind of a depth, kind of a palimpsest of different kind of project program um, needs quite a while. These are, are two images of, uh, let's say, this uh, Eastern Harbor, Oslik Handelskart, Eastern Harbor area um, prior to the development with the old warehouses and then right hand side to see the built and in the, in, on, the, on the left of this island connected with the bridge now is Karnesem Island and then elongating into Bonius Um this, this whole area was kind of on the image down, kind of you see the existing buildings um, like it was. And then we try to kind of look really what kind of program is really relevant and kind of worth to keep. 
um, in relation to the, let's say, the, the material status, um, but also then trying to work with this kind of grain and this kind of morphology and building with this kind of type of a warehouse type, a juxtaposition identification, cantilevering over, going over kind of a mix of different kind of program. And what was, what was also important is kind of working with a, so a variety of different architects. Um, you see here, um, this is an office building KCP also developed. Um, next right hand side is a building of the architecture. And then there are this is also office building. Um, and another building here that is cantilevering. You see cantilevering here is um, also a project of KCP Architects and Blenders, kind of a residential program that is kind of then also bringing in that mix. Um, of office uh, spaces um, versus kind of residential and other kind of um, services and shops. And what is also important to create a place is certain kind of program. We were lucky at that time. Um, you see on the right hand side, a uh, very young Jamie Oliver kind of that uh, opened at that time his first restaurant outside of London, which was called 15 Amsterdam, uh, which was then in this building. Um, which is also kind of an anchor point and sure something very important kind of to transform a kind of a space or place in the city that is not that well known. You see here the sign 15, um, but also the inner corridor now of the inner kind of pathway of this uh, um, development where you really see this next uh, to each other and the dialogue between existing and new buildings and how this kind of defines this new place. Um, just two images because you also have uh, we used very often and Chris Christian did with the ETH also study uh, a project uh, um, studio once in uh, in Istanbul uh, several ones by the way ones about the campuses together with Bilgi University um, and I think that is also in the same way this kind of using um, brownfield sites and also different sites in the city to activate let's say by um, I will come then at the very end of the project again on to have certain kind of activators in the city that by having different positions in the city, activate also the spaces in between because students and also teachers and also kind of visitors kind of go from A to B. And so creating by that a certain kind of activation of a bigger area and a context. Um, another image of one of the sites of Bill University. I think it's a, it's a beautiful mix of new and old and, and, and for sure also bringing in new education, educational program. The next topic, um, it's effects on the ground and uh, a small excursion about placemaking. Um, and this effects on the ground is for us kind of like you saw already with kind of Jamie Oliver or this kind of new buildings kind of to activate a place um, from, the, from, from first sight um, to um, engage and also kind of create an awareness or perception of the citizens and the body about sites that were for a long time not accessible and so therefore a bit of blind spot in the, let's say, the perception of the, the people living in the city. This is an image of um, Zurich, um, where you see also reactivation kind of and, and a transformation uh, of an industrial uh, area, um, which is called indus industrial borough, so to say, industry quartier. Um, and you see, you see here a railway viaduct that is also transformed into a kind of shop and leisure and restaurant gastronomic area, which is pretty interesting to see and transforming by that, let's say, with these new facts on the ground, um, the, the city directly. This is also here, um, this is a project done by Shigaguya in Zurich, also next to this viaduct to see the viaduct here, and a still kind of industrial kind of silo um, function here. Uh, which is a former brewery area um, that is transformed into one hand um, office residential, but also gallery spaces. So there is the, the, the Kunsthalle Zurich, I mean, better than a lot of other galleries um, in that. Um, that was kind of also part of, and that this brings also then a completely new activation into um, an area, um, the Manifesta of Zurich, which then kind of really opened up, um, let's say, and made much more visible for a bigger group and also national group, this kind of area till you can use, um, I like to show this example, you can also use, let's say art or an event, um, but also kind of for communication, let's say even the building, the fences around the building site to transform and kind of inform um, uh, about the new development. Another project where we were using, working with heritage, but also new facts on the ground um, in Zurich is a former um, 
workshop area where trains um, got get still repaired. So what they did is kind of on one hand densify, let's say the surface they use for this workshop to repair the, the train uh, wagons um, and opening up and densifying, let's say a part of this area for um, not residential because that's an area that is not allowed to, um, to live in. Um, this is really dedicated for um, uh, labor within the city. Um, but here was kind of um, the focus on one hand, using this heritage, which are anyhow monuments, but also how can you juxtapose new, like at Ostliga Handelskade, new buildings on top of it, um, dealing with the heritage, the heritage, uh, the heritage department, etc. But using this also infrastructural elements um, is something we add very often um, because it also tells something about the story, the history of the site, and is also part of the soul of the place. So you see on the left hand side existing and on the right hand side some, some examples kind of where we also on top is a project of um, PCP in Amsterdam. We also use with this industrial kind of elements for the staircases or kind of uh, bridges. In Amsterdam, or you see down, down here on the left hand side, this is the OMA transformation of Zeche Tolverein. Um, in Essen, and you have on the other on, on the other side also a uh, building of KCP. We also use this kind of um, a bit more industrial elements, and you see here now existing and how you could again transform, let's say, by um, using um, new aesthetics, kind of like in the Bilge University. Um, here again, one image um, referring to that but also other buildings by adding new and old, you really build a stage, let's say for the, for the existing buildings and build, bring them in a completely different, let's say perception or even beauty. Um, this is uh, one of uh, an uh, event within one of these old existing monuments on this Werkstatt uh, area. This former um, workshop uh, for train with where that was also important kind of that's this specific part of fact, defining facts on the ground directly to engage a bigger public kind of within the, and open the site kind of as a, as a potential kind of new way, new site for work, but also for events, um, jobs, working kind of areas. Um, this is a, this was the design week um, that was then established in that kind of area and kind of completely also informed for sure. And I think it was also pushed for new programmatic kind of infills because people knew then, oh, there is a possibility, there is space. Um, we can use that and kind of also attracted new, let's say now users of the area um, that are now um, transforming um, step-by-step -step, um, this site. This, I said earlier, kind of to make a kind of small excursion about placemaking, what defines a place. Um, I like to stress that on, on four theses, kind of we think um, are relevant. One is for sure, um, let's say the ground level. I always spoke about that earlier. So that is really defining the space where we walk, how we, um, let's say what, what, where we kind of engage with other people, where we go into a shop, kind of enter a building. So that is really crucial. Sure, that's also kind of the critical mass on top relevant, but the ground level really counts a lot. The second um, thesis is, is uh, let's say that this ground level needs to have a certain kind of grain, this kind of short blocks, the permeability, a porosity, kind of to allow for um, movement, for kind of getting together and also differentiation between more or less faster areas, kind of, kind of public areas, but also semi-public area, more embraced areas kind of to to stay, to, to, to sit together, to meet. A uh, third uh, point is really kind of defined places that are open for certain ways of adaptil adaptab adaptability. So very often spaces are maybe too designed so that there's only one use possible, which we think is not that um, successful. So, trying to define areas where people can, let's say, do completely different things, kind of spaces that engage with different kind of ages, with different kind of social groups and allow for, for gathering, getting together and mingling. And the fourth is a place is more than the sum of what it is. And it is very important kind of on one hand, this heritage, but also what is close by and what I already said um, around the, um, 
for the Burger University to define certain kind of spaces in a city um, that are also in a distance that kind of create a movement between these different kind of places discussion. Um, and by doing that, this is a diagram we did uh, for the master plan, on the development framework for the, uh, the legacy of the Olympics in London, um, looking very carefully to the character areas kind of that are already there. Um, so there are already boroughs, there are already villages, there are already people, there's already program there, like, um, and trying to really take this um, very, very serious and bring this together by stitching, let's say, to, to new connections, to new, new program, but also to new, um, let's say, public transport connections um, and bridges over the, over the valley, this program together, but always build up on this heritage to achieve by doing that a much more complex piece of the city, but that still has this kind of different mosaic stones of kind of what has grown there um, and bring in new activity to, to a <clears throat> new kind of program. Ensure there um, was important. And I think that is also something we should keep always in mind, kind of if there is an event like the Olympics or even another event, um, you need to kind of allow accessibility and build infrastructure to get uh, there for people to get there using that in a very, very um, sensible way, kind of already in the very early beginning, and I will show the project later in Hamburg, um, to use that as an urban um, regenerator um, process, because there will, this, this, having planned this very carefully, it can change completely a different, uh, the, the, an area in the city. Um, like for instance, here, the Lower Lee Valley, which was kind of prior to the Olympics, a very deprived industrial area, but contaminated, super, super empty, um, very badly connected, but by connecting it incredibly well due to, let's say, the effort already kind of for the, for the, for the games, but also kind of looking to that into um, a really transformation process of the site um, for long term. Um, London did a very, very good job um, to, to really redevelop this area. And this is one image kind of at the time for the Olympic mode kind of with the, the Olympic Park. Um, looking into this, um, into this kind of regenerated kind of quite uh, it, till, till then quite contaminated um, Lee Valley, um, but using that then as well as a kind of a public park um, later for the urban development that came after. But around the Olympics, I will stress then a bit kind of the the the, the question of this this two modes, which is important kind of also they are already planning kind of the mode that is after because the, an Olympic park is always far too big, more or less for a city, normal, normal functional use for a city. So to go then into um, already they are planning a bit the, the, the shrinking, so to say, of certain kind of sizes or the shrinking also of the venues and because they are also too big for uh, um, everyday use. The last topic um, is the master plan, like I already mentioned, as a flexible framework. Um, and here I like to show very, um, really this kind of plans, like um, show a little bit this, let's say this flexibility that is necessary. This is London planned, um, the plan drawn by Sir Christopher Wren after the great fire in 1666. And this is London kind of how it was then um, built. And if you go back and forth, you see the church down there in the middle, but for the rest, there's a lot of changes. So to define, and that is an example, let's say an example um, for this, uh, the city is always um, the result of a negotiation process between a, diff a lot of different groups. Um, and therefore um, has also to, to be developed in a multidisciplinary project, uh, process and also in a, in a quite good embedded kind of process, kind of on the analytics of the site as such. Um, one project um, that we also created in that kind of um, with the idea with this DNA is the Half City in Hamburg, which was a bit the doubling of the city center of Hamburg at the time. Um, we had there, let's say, talking about adaptive reuse um, and all the new buildings. The only old building that were, was there on site was uh, Kai Speicher A here in front. You probably all, all know this building that is luckily kind of we could keep because there were also plans kind of to destroy that. Um, and now um, being really this flagship of the Philharmonic uh, building of HDM, um, globally well known. Um, and a big 
we have were lucky that we had a Speicherstadt as a kind of heritage site that would, was the back, backbone, so to say, and the angle between let's say, the new the new part of the city and the existing city center. And you have here a view, let's say, look, looking back to the to the Binner Alstom, um, and really seeing, let's say, the size of the city center and let's say the size of only part of the half city in the front. And here in the middle, the Speicherstadt as a backbone, um, this heritage uh, buildings. It was, let's say, to stress here, but this kind of notion of flexible framework, the plan was kind of at that time, kind of when KCP started, I wanted competition to develop uh, an office city. Um, but uh, the framework was so far um, flexible. Um, luckily, it was also it's not, not realized as an office city, but it's quite a mixed use area. Um, to create this vibrancy kind of, and there were a lot of different, let's say, scenarios within this kind of different, different islands. Um, and stressing once again, this kind of different layers of heritage kind of and using this kind of um, very strong backbones. This is an image into this, from the Speicherstadt with this kind of beautiful infrastructure building in front, and then looking to this crown of the Philharmonic um, but the base is also kind of still um, working with this kind of heritage of this brick building of the Kaispeichen. And here an image of the, uh, the public space um, uh, of one part of the half city with the Philharmonic uh, building in the back. Um, this is a public space that once in a while kind of is also flooded. So to, 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 to really also there use kind of maybe changes uh, in seasons or changing climate kind of we have to anyhow integrate is much more kind of looking into kind of areas that can carry water, um, uh, but not in a normal day, they are used for, for public open spaces where people can get together. Um, here you see once again, let's say the city center of Hamburg, then this island in the middle is the whole um, half city. And then we were working in 2015 for the plans for the Olympics that were kind of uh, stopped then by a referendum of uh, a participation was a referendum of the, of the civic uh, body of uh, uh, Hamburg. This was, let's say, the site, Rasbrook, for the Olympics. And it was also there kind of even in parallel thinking kind of already, what could the games be then later as a transformation process for the city? And they really... Um, use that um, for the Sprung über die Elbe um, says kind of to jump over the, the river um, Elbe. And this was really a strategic kind of set of the, the city, the politics, but also the Hafen City um, Development Agency to really take this kind of, again, big motor of infrastructure, public transport and accessibility of the Olympics and to develop, let's say, to, 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 to develop, let's say, the city in that direction and going direction to Williamsburg Harbor, which is a bit uh, the, uh, the, the, not that well, let's say, part of the city, um, but embracing, um, let's say, or jumping with this kind of set, kind of bringing these two parts together, like um, Amsterdam and Rotterdam are also doing last years already for a long time. Um, you see here, let's say, the, the uh, city mode already, and we have um, what they did at the time is in, in London, it was kind of a bit um, sequen uh, consequential, kind of they, they had first, they planned the Olympics and they started then the legacy mode a bit later, but it was ongoing, let's say um, in parallel, so to say. Um, and you see here going back once again, kind of how this kind of developed them from 2015 to 20 kind of how it's envisioned, kind of how it's developing further and growing really together um, until 2040. And this will for sure develop a bit differently, but there is a framework, let's say, within that, this kind of whole city will then develop. And you see the process in 2003, let's say, till 2010, um, what different kind of products kind of were developed um, where we were partly involved and then it was taken over from London a lot of different offices was huge, big multidisciplinary group working on that already. Let's say we were working for between 2007 to 2010, um, and then also involved in some competitions um, later for the further redevelopment of the site. And it's still ongoing. 
but you probably all know the success story of East London and it's transforming now over time. This was, let's say, um, let's say first sketch scan, where come the, will the city come, let's say, and how does the city then interlock with, let's say, the park um, of, um, of the Olympic Park and the venues. And we constantly there kind of worked in parallel. Um, this is um, also the, is the mode, let's say, during the Olympics and the Paralympics. And then you have the mode, let's say, where you really see, let's say, that the Olympic Park, but also the venues shrink and um, the city kind of grows. Um, what I already mentioned earlier to really create um, the, the, the good sizes of public spaces, open spaces, but also sports venues. And a special point of this proposal at the time was we were working with Arabs and uh, Argus on, and also GMP. It was a kind of a joint group um, of focusing on partly the team around GMP and um, was uh, Gerke Michael Partner was working on the venues and the uh, KCP and Arabs mainly. Um, it's focused mainly on the, the urban implementation of the fast book and the plan. And you see here, let's say also again, the Olympic and the Paralympic power, mode, and then um, the city mode. And what was special here is that we kind of transformed, we had a proposal um, that the, the stadium will be then um, a residential um, program or ha have a residential program around. So transforming and transforming a, a sports venue then really in a mixed use future mixed use kind of sports and residential kind of uh, building. Um, uh, last project I'd like to show um, in relation to this um, heritage or kind of also using these facts on the ground, all the new buildings, but also the assets, let's say the resources the city has. Um, and that is the, the key message about this um, adaptive reuse and, and using um, a lot of elements on site is a project we are working uh, at the moment um, with the European Redevelopment, Regeneration Development Bank um, in Pula, Croatia. A uh, beautiful, beautiful city that has a lot of um, empty brownfields, um, military brownfields, but also kind of a big shipyard that is, they try to still get, um, let's say, going again. Um, but how to bring, um, let's say, all these different assets and old buildings, empty buildings, they have in a beautiful kind of um, uh, buildings, but also incredibly big size harbor areas that have a huge potential for um, a new productive city, kind of mixed use of production and living or other civic and other services, but creating especially an access through this kind of areas that are at the moment completely fenced and not accessible for the citizens. So the city of Pula is on one hand has a rich heritage on a lot of kind of uh, <clears throat> in a lot of ways kind of if you come from the outside but I think it's, that's also interesting to see and I think if I would say this for a city I'm living in that is in the same state I would probably not be capable to say that because I think it's always this objective view um, and seeing seeing the potential and because of it, because a lot of, a lot of people there see the problem, let's say for sure also of this empty and empty areas. But stressing again, kind of this circular moment, circular reuse of reuses that are there and that are kind of touching a lot of things. So it's not only building industrial areas, um, there are businesses already there, how can we create around that? And what is the, the, the status of connectivity and how can we stitch this, this more together? What is the state of the environment, the ecology, and kind of increasing qualifying that um, to maximum? Then there, down there, there's a big uh, question also around tourism. Should be only one pillar and kind of also focusing, kind of having a, a synergy with special um, education, but also industries. Then what kind of commercial services are there? Can build up, they have a lot of heritage buildings um, and also a lot of education and innovation. How do you bring, especially kind of with this kind of different motors that are there, um, new life into the city. Um, <clears throat> what we always do is then kind of um, creating a treasure map, so to say, um, of a mapping of different of existing heritage buildings, but also potential sites existing. And I think that's crucial. Um, also natural kind of heritage, which I think we should focus much more on. Um, then you see here, let's say industries in blue, um, the shipyards. So this whole area here around is at the moment not accessible at all um, because it's fenced. 
And this is a military site, so also not accessible. There are a lot of um, very, very nice waterfronts at the moment, not accessible for the city. There's here, let's say, in this kind of red area is the university. And there here, there's a maritime hospital that we like to engage with now to also for startups, that's also for the university. The university is also already in there. And by doing that, then creating stepping stones around what is brown mentioned uh, um, here, colored um, the city center. There's also a lot of heritage spaces like the, area, the famous arena from, of Pula to create um, also connectivities and moving lines between these different sites. And by that kind of activating the city center as such. Um, but what we also think, what is the what is the idea of how can you look into the bigger system and not just only on several kind of spots? Because the first question was to look through only some military sites um, and which ones are the high pot highest potential to then transform them. And we first kind of did this whole lecture of the city and in a bigger scale, also looking to let's say assets they have around in the region. Like for instance, Bayouni Island, kind of, which is also a kind of a touristic attraction that can go into a dialogue with, for instance, this peninsula museum, but also other kind of um, point. Let's say here, a Mido Baza, former, former, so um, military site, um, that can be transformed into into beach. But also, they are looking really to the existing building, and then also proposing maybe completely different kind of ways of approaching. Um, and, and maneuvering, kind of taking the sea not as a barrier, but also as a connector and introducing a motor mobility, which was um, quite surprising for the city planning department to think about that. Um, but sure, we can compare that with, for instance, Rotterdam and Amsterdam, where this is completely normal. Um, but telling them this kind of, they were pretty open about that. At the moment, this doesn't exist, but we have also to look to sure um, connectivity lines that are still, um, in this functional area of the harbor. But trying to get to, to really bring these two functions together, I think is a crucial aspect, which was still now not really seen um, there. So we will look to this on one hand, this triangle between Briuni National Park, this, um, so to say, city national park of Musil, uh, but also looking to a triangle in a city like I already had to, to to really look to different kinds of aspects and also looking on one hand to long-term strategies for different um, development areas, but also look to, to immediate um, facts on the ground and really injections within the city center, reusing existing buildings and trying to activate their grade levels. Then we zoomed in into this kind of um, city area to really again looking here like the university, you know, different spots on site to create the synergies and then act activating by that a main a main corridor um, and the main um, the main main street um, within the city center that is the moment pretty empty. Um, here again, let's say then diagrammatically, kind of how we look to the program um, education synergies between education and businesses and entrepreneurship. And trying to engage long term as soon as possible, also with industries to kind of try to connect maybe on some punctual points to access the water, but keeping this productivity really also um, in the city. And, and by doing that, kind of um, creating this, um, so to say, magnetic kind of um, yield around the city center and here then um, the, a bit of view on heritage buildings that are all there, beautiful views, also walls, you know, behind again. Um, incredibly interesting buildings um, that are at the moment empty that can be activated. Um, and one is here now, that's it is Maritime Hospital, um, where the university, we try to engage and also with new businesses and startup and not only the university to create a synergy to also activate long-term, let's say the parts of the harbor area. And this is all embedded, let's say in a bigger scale plan then also to look into green um, infrastructure, but also green connectors. You see here these green flashes, um, let's say they come out of the hinterland and then really perforate by green and with green and blue infrastructure also for, um, let's say, uh, cooling within the city, but also biodiversity um, in the city and bringing that then uh, towards the waterfront um, and also to the to, let's say, to create by that a kind of permeability and walkability within the city center. It is at the moment kind of there's a huge lack of green and um, it's not that difficult to bring it in. 
but also using, um, like you see here, again, this is the peer. Maybe I go quickly back, back to one plan. This is this very, very long peer here that, that uh, um, protects the city from the sea. Um, Pula was a very long time. It's the far out, far, further, far, farthest outpost, let's say, of Croatia. So it was clear a kind of a strategic site in former times for, uh, for the country. But using this peer, you know, if you look to that, I don't know what that kind of someone in Pula said, they were kind of, yeah, what do you want to do with that? This is a piece of art in itself, if you look at it. Um, and using this kind of, let's say, heritage objects um, to engage um, also in a sensible way, um, I think is very crucial, let's say, within our profession. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for this enlightening lecture. Um, if that's okay for you, I will share my screen. Uh, yes, I sure, I stop. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, now we will move on uh, with question and answer session. Uh, this session will take about 30, 30 minutes. So we have a very limited time. Uh, please keep your questions and comments uh, short and clear so that we can answer more people. Um, uh, we pr prefer to listen to your questions. So instead of writing through chat box, you can use raise hand button, which you can find on the bottom of your Zoom screen or on the participant list next to your name. You can also see this uh, on the image that I'm sharing, uh, how to find the uh, raise hand button. Uh, just a quick reminder for you to activate your interpretation slash translation button. Uh, you can ask your questions in English or in Turkish, which, uh, which one you prefer. Uh, either way, uh, it will be translated by our amazing translator, Alpash. Um, you can check your interpretation option if you cannot hear our translator right now. Uh, so yeah, we can <laughs> give people a minute to, you know, get over their shyness, I guess. Okay. Oh, well, are there questions already in the chat? Uh, no, um, I'm asking them to raise yeah. their hand. Yeah. yeah, also understanding or kind of yeah, curiosity, kind of everything is um, mm -hmm. everything possible. Okay, uh, another reminder for you that uh, we are right now broadcasting live on YouTube. So if you don't want to uh, turn on your cameras, you can click keep it uh, turned off but we prefer to see your faces so that we can uh, kind of feel like that we're in the same room Definitely. with you. <laughs> okay. It'd be very nice to see who's there, yeah. Definitely, thank you. Thank you for opening our camera. Thank you very much. Yulmaz uh, Bey, would you like to? Thank you very much. It was very, very exciting. Uh, uh, congratulations, first of all. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, very useful uh, for our young students, architects, uh, widen up their view, their vision, uh, the things you realized by now. I may just uh, ask a question. Uh, how can we keep uh, the spirit of, uh, let's say, a historical building or uh, an industrial heritage building while adding uh, new parts, uh, new materials, uh, new functions. So, uh, uh, how to uh, manage the uh, to keep this spirit alive? I mean, not the building itself. Uh, I mean, the spirit is the atmosphere of the existing uh, old uh, construction. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think what you what I showed in several kind of projects, like for instance the Oslo Handelskade, um, is in a way let's say it's good to have, but also what you see is in several kind of developments um, you have in Istanbul as well, kind of to to try to uh, really look which kind of buildings have a status that you can really keep them and transform them, um, and then going with um, let's say. First of all, trying really to keep them also as they are and only refurbish for instance, kind of, kind of or renew um, windows or kind of broken parts. We had, did, for instance, a, 
it's very often kind of with craftsmen, kind of you know, on a building site, you have to tell them kind of you don't need to clean this kind of you know keep it please. We did a building in uh, an old, uh, let's say, monument uh, in in a small town close to Zurich, and there was luckily the investor also that we kind of do because this 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 contrast between you know old and broken and maybe this patina kind of that is there that should stay and kind of by putting everything else that is new um, in it, um, very sensible and not kind of, especially not cladding, let's say not hiding this old heritage because we have also a building in Zurich that is uh, pretty crucial. We call them always, but for this building, for the site in Aarau, they said kind of that should not this pulse um, appear, this pulse fünf, this building is called like that, pulse fünf uh, effect, because there it happened that the whole facade kind of covers the old building. So you nearly don't see parts of the old facade. And then you go in and you have an inner courtyard and you're standing then there in an old building. And this, does not, this, fun, this doesn't function really. This is not functioning really very well. So I think it's really this next switch. Other like for instance, also for us in Prada, you know, you have some months, once in a while you can, maybe you can one building you can cover and you have a new one that is mirroring the old one. But I think this, and that you saw also in this kind of that the reason why I like this image of the Ozzelinger Handelskader that much kind of where you go through this inner street and you see in a new glass facade, you see the old building reflecting. So there is a dialogue between the old and the new and that is pretty, this is very, very important. And, and this is on a city level, but this is also on a building level important. So that you, for instance, in this kind of industrial hall, they are close to Zurich. Um, there was then also the, the, the person who did the window frames. We asked them to use the old wooden window frames as long as possible and just kind of repair when necessary. And we also only wanted to have them have them very kind of subtle kind of um, colored, just, um, I don't know the English expression for that, so that you, you still see the wood and you still, you still see this kind of points of repair. Um, and then the craftsman came and said, yeah, but you still see that. And so, yeah, I like to see that. It's really good to see that kind of, because it's, it's really showing this, um, yeah, we call it patina. I think this is in a yes. way kind of, if you have a new development, um, it needs quite a time to get this patina. Why do we go, for instance, why is, why, why is it so nice to go to Mediterranean cities, also to Istanbul to be there? Because you have this, you have these buildings, you know, and there is this heritage. There is this, there are the stories, let's say, this kind of building are telling us. And also kind of, if, even if you don't know, they carry it in a way. I think that creates a, a really the soul and the history, the memory, the, the, the collective memory of a city. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we try very often, let's say we tend as architects very often to make it too nice, but too clean. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. interrupting. That's the problem. Thank um, you very much. Thank you, Yumaz uh, Actually, um, uh, okay, uh, Sinabe, I'll give the floor to you. You can, can you open your mic? Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, thank you for the very nice presentation. Uh, um, it was very um, uh, systematic in a way. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, regarding uh, old and new, if you uh, design a new building next to an old building, is there is uh, you have a, like a principle approach how the old building uh, should the old the new building uh, should relate to the old building, or is circumstantial uh, depending on the situation whether the new building should stand out or just disappear or something like that. Do you have any, any approach, any systematic approach for that? That depends very much on the situation. Um, let's say, to, is there, and also the amount of old and new. Um, in the Osiliganiskade, for instance, kind of there we said that the new buildings, well, how I explained, you know, have, have also the same volumetry, kind of have the same kind of with bulky sizes of these warehouses and playing with this volumetric kind of that is already existing. Um, and there it was much more kind of getting an integration, let's say, on such, but also um, sh showing a die. It's always a bit of dialogue. Um, if you have only 
one old build, it depends also on the question of the program, you know, kind of you need to add or put into a build, uh, existing building. But I think it's, it's, very, it's very important to look very, very careful to decide and not, um, on one hand, what I said earlier, not trying to hide, let's say, this, um, this age, age things, but also um, very often it has really to do with the dimensions. For instance, this project Werkstatt, where I showed kind of also um, this big holes, and there were also there are also these big gardens in between. Um, and then allowing the existing buildings still to be present enough. So the new buildings or the, the, the add-ons should not clad, should not kind of um, let's say going in a con concurrence kind of with it. If you see, for instance, the, and I'm really, I think we, all, we are all really happy that uh, this Kaispeicher A in Hamburg stayed because there were kind of a lot of different new glass towers kind of designed already. In the beginning, they wanted really to destroy this, this, uh, this big, uh, this big, big ware, um, warehouse. Um, but I think now it's it's very very important kind of and this it's it's really a duality you know between the brick body there and and the top and it can also be if, if you have only a small a small heritage building very often we also look to kind of build stage around a new one you know to really um, to really let this existing flourish in a way. I think that is, that is more the attitude. So there's not, not one principle kind of, it's very, very situa situation um, depending how you act. But the, the, the key message is kind of that it should not be pushed too far in the back because it's very, it, it's really transferring, let's say the, the site with the new development and program into the next generation. And I think it's very often also relevant what kind of program is it? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have another question uh, from one of our our founders, Jaila Kulin. Uh, she's in a um, she's not in the uh, right place to speak up, so I'm going to read her question instead. Uh, she says, "Thank you for being with us today, Ute. How do you cope with the pre-project analysis process through different cultures and countries?" Um, we we work always with let's say local partners, um, especially let's say for instance in but in Germany it's easy but still also there we always try to look for let's say first first of all we always work with multidisciplinary teams so we have very often you know a traffic planner a landscaper we have an economic kind of a program 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 expert maybe even a sociologist kind of then engineering topics like what a Sensitive development infrastructure um, utilities. Um, and there we try to build up a team then with local partners that have a lot of no local knowledge. Um, maybe I can describe this kind of on the project in Pula because um, very well, because I don't speak Croatian, which makes it pretty difficult. I say we luckily have two collaborators that speak Croatian. Um, and then we have also local partners, first of all, for we work there with Urbanex from Zagreb, um, who have a big knowledge, um, let's say, in urban management and all these processes um, and uh, the statutory planning kind of um, questions, but also a um, big network of engineers. And then we have KBMG, also from Croatia, kind of looking to the market kind of questions. And then we always go on site. First of all, we do a, an analysis of all the material kind of from, from, from so to say, far off. Um, and then we for sure go on site and kind of do really field research and work strongly with local partners together. And I think this is always very, very fruitful. And um, for instance, also for an airport city development, uh, Dublin Airport at the time, there was a big question. Uh, one of the biggest questions was what kind of program, what kind of economic real estate you would you could kind of establish there because it's a it's quite remote airport. It's uh, not well connected in the in the uh, in the public transport system of the country, like for instance Zurich Airport or Schiphol Airport. So it's a destination to fly and a destination to arrive. How do you to activate, um, let's say, a program around the airport there? 
Um, and there we had, on one hand, a real estate kind of economic kind of expert from Dublin itself. We had one um, special expert from Schiphol, which is, by the way, a planner, Amara Trafsma. Plus, we had uh, an expert from the UK, um, Simon O'Donnell at the time, kind of who, who had experience within UK um, around airports and city, uh, let's say, business districts. He was working, for instance, also um, around um, uh, uh, for Chiswick Park in uh, London. So, because um, he's well. so, it's um, that is that is re- that was crucial in that kind of point to really translate, you know, kind of ideas we can maybe bring off we have from other projects, but how can you translate this into the local system? Um, because each each planning, economical or let's say cultural system is different, um, and this. This bringing these two things together is, I think, what, what we really like to do and also are very capable to do. But we really strongly also listen and look to what is there. And without that, it's impossible. So you need to understand, let's say, the local, the local codes. The, and very often, it's also, it also takes time. We work, for instance, just to, as an anecdote to, to phrase that kind of a... We won in 2015 um, an international tender for the second CBD district and uh, around, let's say, the high speed train station um, between Singapore um, and Kuala Lumpur um, called Jurong Lake District, um, which is called by the Jurong Lake that is there and a very nice uh, green uh, um, uh, heritage already um, they have there. Um, and there was the question kind of to build a, a hybrid radical mix, let's say, um, walkable uh, central business district in Singapore, which is completely opposite than the central existing central business district is and how Singapore plan is planned till date. So we had also to work, with, but we had also their local planners um, working with, with Arabs, but also a kind of landscape architect, like a kind of local from, from Singapore. But also with the local authorities like the National Transport Authority and the um, URA, the uh, uh, Regeneration Authority. But let's say the, to then bring these new ideas in, even if the client, let's say, on a very high political level asks for it, um, we had then to convince, let's say, also the administration, but also the engineers kind of to, to really look different to how you build the street. Because they couldn't, they couldn't except in the early beginning that we say, you have to reduce the lane on your street for bicycles. No, you can't. So you change, and we were really also asked to change the, the planning codes, you know. But by doing that, kind of, you also need to, 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 to bring the whole body of, let's say, administration that was working now for 50 years in a different direction and with different kind of rules and kind of um, mindsets. Um, and that takes time. And a lot of communication to translate that then kind of into something else, kind of to to um, to convince, let's say, that this is, might be better to go in a different direction. So that is that takes very often a lot of work is communicating, presenting, kind of convincing, bring bringing different opinions together. It's a lot of um, choreography between different um, players. But it's nice if you get then something done. But if we would be, for instance, I tr- I try to put in, but due to the technical problems I had with my machine, well, I'm, I'm really sorry for that. Kind of that I let you ha- have let you wait so long because my computer is really run down, and I'm depending on this machine at the moment because I'm in Vienna, not in Zurich, in the office. Um, I also wanted to add a, an, an image we worked also for uh, on, on this uh, valley, valley for Life in, uh, in Istanbul. And I think there's also, you know, kind of looking to this, and there we also were working with local partners because without that, you are really just incapable to provide um, uh, a plan that is, that is um, on one hand, kind of also, um, let's say, embedded in the local systems. But also, kind of, I think it's very crucial to also engage with the with the and 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 with the with different communities, with different groups, like we do in Pula with University, with the with the, 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 the 
the German of architects and so on to, to really engage already with the civic body of the city because they have to bring then the plan into life and then and, and have to make this transformation of the of the area. And we are far 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 too far away to do that. And, and that needs really then a constant a continuity, a co-creation and a co um, co-working or collaboration on uh, and to, to bring that there. And for instance, let's say for the city, for the Hafen city in Hamburg, um, there is sure that was a quite quite a robust plan, but um, on a good plan maybe and had a lot of, but also long-term process with KCP and us to, 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 to change that and, uh, over time. Um, but there was also kind of a real heavy political standing and a city planning department and the Hafen city game behind itself with the, the two people ahead, Jon Walter and also Jon Brunsbjörnthelk, who really developed that on site and also know their city um, by heart, you know, kind of even till the, till the, till the garbage bin, um, because they develop, developed it together. So I think this is really, that has to be done on site. Um, and sure, we were always engaged to a certain extent, and Christian is still, let's say, in, in in a sort of advisory board, um, but it has to be done there with the uh, with the people, um, with the local with the local forces. Thank you so much for your answer. I think this is maybe a misunderstanding. It's not kind of to spread out everything everywhere, but to to allow, let's say, um, for a certain kind of mix where it's possible to mix. For instance, this area is where I was talk also showing quickly Werkstatt area in Zurich, this workshop for train uh, wagon repair. This will stay a kind of um, uh, an industrial kind of a labor um, labor district. You know, there will be no residential, the residential is attached. But by, for instance, um, let's say to look for which kind of, uh, first of all, kind of we, were, we work very often or mainly on areas that are empty, Kind of these industrial areas that are empty, they are not for nothing called brownfield or waiting lands. And for instance, this um, this area in Pula, um, we will not, and that is also very often a misunderstanding. I think in the beginning they, they thought kind of okay, we regeneration they associated with new touristic kind of venues. So no, this is not what we mean. We like to keep this kind of product productive areas also productive. But if the shipyard is not working anymore or doesn't need the, the whole amount of footprint that it kind of covers now, which cuts off the city from the bay completely. And um, how do you organize, let's say, the shipping industry, which is pretty small at the moment, or let's say not, not really working, but um, pretty small at the moment, but also really taking care of these productive areas and kind of for new productivity. It's not about kind of transforming this into like in a half a city into an inner city living district. Um, and we should even more look to kind of mix of productive kind of areas. And then you have other, um, let's say affine programs next to that. And then you go into residential, but also, but not also, also residential, not completely monofunctional. And that is kind of, for instance, in Singapore, also the case, this creates a lot of um, a lot of streets, a lot of commuting, for, and, and not very, let's say, you know, um, vibrant city districts because there's, let's say, then a certain period of time there is nothing happening. Um, and it's always about a, a adequate mix of different programs, but um, it's very, very crucial, I think even more crucial, um, as, as what it's something shows us kind of to have um, productive areas very close um, to keep also logistics very close and trying to kind of look to this organism of a city that its function in itself as such with its hinterland, but also kind of in a fair way. And that is what we try to do. Uh, we have another question uh, from Egera Fetyakshi. You can but both, let's say, in, in this kind of, um, in this Olympic plans in both is on one hand a grow and in the parallel already the shrinking, let's say, but part is, you know, the, the venues and the open space is shrinking and the, the, the city, let's say the mixed use city living and working areas is growing, but also shrinking is a question of planning. Sure, kind of, kind of if you like to consolidate um, and maybe we would even have to do that stronger 
kind of we have so much soil, let's say, um, already used of this globe. So we should not build on Greenland anymore. And that's the reason why we should really kind of really focus on the densification of already former industrial kind of already sealed areas, maybe even densify much more where we, for instance, kind of use very extensively soil with logistics areas and so on, and kind of try to embed this also with a much more radical mixed use work on top of that kind of have sports, leisure or innovation district on top of that. And if we don't need that, and that also happened in the Netherlands in the in a financial and a real estate crisis um, between 2009 and 2014, there were big discussions about um, not stopping the building sector, but also not allowing to build new if they have too many empty kind of um, buildings somewhere where they are not very well located. And I think that is really, we really have to look to where we build and how are these areas connected um, and how, mainly let's say and focusing on the areas that are kind of accessible by public and shared kind of mobility um, that we kind of try to avoid long distances and then densify there and maybe shrink and maybe also re give certain kind of areas back to nature and um, that was a discussion kind of that happened at that time kind of somebody was allowed to build but they also had to kind of show their assets somewhere else and if they have empty office spaces somewhere in a green field JVD not accessible to really say then, okay, give this back to nature um, and um, then you're allowed to build, but not kind of constantly produce, produce, or produce and uh, kind of keep uh, empty, empty buildings like they are. Um, and that is also um, that we discuss at the moment in another project in South of Switzerland. Maybe also thinking about something like uh, um, Vancouver has. In Vancouver, um, they have a kind of uh, tax on empty residential or empty, you can do this or better empty residential or office space or kind of industrial kind of space, because then you have to take care of this kind of areas, because otherwise we kind of um, conti continuously kind of go on and uh, um, destroy our planet kind of rapidly. But the shrinking process kind of that is very often that is happening in Eastern Germany, kind of how do you shrink, let's say, cities? And it's, it's also a part of planning. And what we, for instance, now in, in, uh, in what was, for instance, is you, you started your question with, with London. Um, it's in a way there is a framework, but you, you try to build and kind of the phases, the development phases should kind of be there where there is already built. So you let the developments, let's say, these existing neighborhoods grow and not, not starting on the other side um, because you, to keep as much as possible open space still. Um, and it's open space can then, if it's not a park, can also be productive, uh, productive landscape, cultural landscape can be also reused in, in, in that way. Maybe kind of that will maybe even happen now. Um, we, we face with the pandemic, especially in these 10 cities. I'm curious how this was or is in Istanbul. Didn't follow that that much yet, but um, um, we need to have much more open green space, much more nature close by um, and have to infiltrate cities with that um, green and blue infrastructure much more um, to be capable to um, be robust enough to stand this kind of, to, 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 to live in this kind of conditions. And that would be also much more better for the climate. In, in fact, it's a very, I think we learn a lot at the moment kind of due to the climate crisis, but also the pandemic, how we should, um, let's say, plan our cities for the future. Thank you so much. Um, do we have more questions or comments from the audience? Uh, you can use the raise hand button or <laughs> type in text. Okay. Uh, actually, in uh, spring semester in Aura, uh, we also have a, a theme, uh, which is um, adaptability. So I'm thinking uh, we might have more questions from our participants as well. That would be really nice. You can ask your questions in Turkish or in English as well. Which one would you prefer? 
just uh, because you are experienced, uh, do you know any effective strategy uh, to keep uh, workplaces, uh, places for production, craftsmen and artisans, uh, keep them aside after uh, this renewal or reuse uh, projects? You know, usually uh, after this kind of uh, operations, uh, the whole side uh, usually uh, realizes a kind of gentrification and the people already exist there, uh, keep their position and they cannot su support anymore uh, the high uh, cost of rent, etc. And uh, we have this problem in Istanbul. And I think in many places, uh, the same, is the same. People, uh, maybe not at the beginning, but during the course of time, they must go and they leave uh, for other uh, places to other businesses, which may bring more uh, income, more uh, profitable, et cetera. Is there any uh, applied uh, strategy for this to keep the production places, uh, again, uh, for production, at least basically for production? Uh, how can it is not maybe an architectural question, but uh, it's uh, how we can keep our cities alive. I think. No, that's it's a good question. It's not. It, it's it's for for us as an ur urbanists, uh, urban planners, kind of it's it's crucial, kind of, and that's the reason why I why we also always say, kind of, trying to provide a bit of radical mix to keep not um, to really keep different groups in an area and also to keep this productive areas also within the city because then you have because you have not the best sites because there is there are still some emissions or there's still some noise kind of and you have still kind of um and you, you can you can stop this gentrification process that was for instance where if, if we talk about regeneration is it it is not kind of it should go like in let's say the harvest city is therefore not the best the, the best example kind of if you would have we work at the moment on two three let's say this Buddha project is one but also on two kind of um, sites in the Netherlands kind of the Val Quartier in Nijmegen and uh, Sandstadt uh, Achterstadt and Sandstadt which are uh, and this the, the last one Achterstadt and Sandstadt is so to say on the northern side of Amsterdam which is a complete industrial area but that should be also will also be transferred like a lot of other areas in the north of Amsterdam into kind of more mixed use areas. So a lot of production still, a lot of enterprises, kind of startups in that, and, and also keeping them there to not to 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 really not go only into one direction of a kind of very well situated kind of living in, in let's say office area, but really also leaving spaces kind of um, open for this adaptive ad, adaption of different kind of people, you know, kind of and, and, and cultural scene, but also subcultural scene and kind of, they need also this kind of more affordable spaces. And you can plan that. And I think this is really what we try to kind of do if we are allowed to. That is also a question, you know, you, that is also, let's say you try to, to, for instance, in Pula, we had to discuss a lot, especially with the city because, um, and these discussions are still ongoing because we're still working on that project, but the uh, EBRD was quite happy with that approach because let's say for this peninsula, there was a plan to, to provide only tourist resorts and a golf course on this peninsula. And then we said, Sorry, but this is really not the way to go. First of all, not for your city, second, and for your citizens at the city as a whole. And um, this will want, this is not healthy. First of all, you have a lot of beautiful natural, let's say it's it's nearly a natural resort, this peninsula. And um, you hopefully will not destroy this with a golf course. Point one. Second, because a golf course is per se not a kind of a very by, by biodiverse or natural kind of system. Um, second, this should on, not only be for tourists, this should be for the city and for everybody. And kind of there can be certain kind of touristic kind of attractions on some spots, but that have to be integrated into a programmatic kind of approach for the whole city. Because otherwise you will, let's say, 
citizens will leave the city because it's not so very nice um, to, you have to channelize, let's say, or to, to steer how much visitors you like to have uh, in, a, in a city because otherwise you have a Venice kind of uh, phenomena that people kind of yeah. live outside. And this is then not any more interesting kind of to, it's then just kind of for a visit, it's nice, but it's not a healthy system, you know, it's not a kind of urban vibrant kind of um, system where people really like to live, to work, to, And that is that. That has to be, let's say, very, very the programmatic part within an urban planning project is really, really crucial. And very often, it's not so easy to um, to make this understandable. That it's not um, also in a in a Swiss project a competition where we are now not anymore in the last round, but it was a so to say more nearly an architectural urban project in one. A kind of a new subcentrality of a station, let's say a, a second station next to the main station, kind of so two nodes um, that should be also transport, let's say, developed like that, that, that's what oriented development areas, but subcentrality is within the city. Um, and we had as a team to team up with, a, let's say, an urbanist kind of architects, seven architects, because it's talking about quite an area of different buildings. Um, perfect planner, landscape architect, um, engineers. Plus, we needed to have investors for the area that is not for the city because the city workshop, so to say, that repairs all infrastructure within the city kind of has one big plot there, which is interesting also to keep this, this very important infrastructure for the functioning of a city, let's say, in an area like that. I well, was really happy about that, kind of to keep that there. But then we had a quite a discussion with the, with the let's say, the the leader, which was kind of the, so to say, constructive, uh, this construction uh, um, and development uh, um, department, uh, partner. Um, yeah, it's easier to work with one investor for all residential program, which was the rest was all, that's it. They have, and then, then we said, no, um, we need to have several ones because otherwise we offer only one kind of, you know, um, offer of, of resi residential program, and this will get never uh, will, will never be uh, uh, an interesting kind of vibrant part of the city because it's more a kind of a settlement on top of something else, you know. And this understanding that you need uh, you need more different kind of um, also investors that that can be different kind of program. They have different kind of clientele. They like to really have to have a so certain social mix in a in a in a in a city city district of a certain size, that is really important. And the architecture is only, a good, a good urban plan has to kind of, case said once kind of a good, case Christian said once a good urban plan have, has to be capable to digest bad architecture. Not kind of promoting kind of bad architecture, not at all, but kind of the, 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 the setup of a project kind of programmatic wise, spatial wise, volumetric wise, and also accessibility, et cetera, kind of has to be stable enough to, to handle different 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 architects like the Hafen City did, you know. And not all of that. And then you also have to think about, and I think it's also in a way interest good to say maybe what what areas are really strategic um, for orientation, accessibility, and so on, and have to be done, have to maybe undergo a competition. And there are others they can build in a certain kind of way, under a certain rule set, but don't need to be necessarily. Um, of that quality, you can also kind of, um, I think that would be also, for instance, interesting to, to look at a plan that is what is really, what really has to be really designed and what can be also kind of filled up by um, local, local initiatives, you know, in a certain way, kind of following certain rules, sure, but um, I think that could be also very interesting, especially for um, uh, living areas, because what you see at the moment um, in, in the, the whole, um, let's say, housing corporation developments in, in, in Switzerland, there are, um, let's say, the ones that kind of keep, let's say, the, the prices, let's say, lower in relation to the open market. Um, what you see in Vienna, and that is also a positive aspect, it's not, uh, it seems like that, um, this, so to say, building groups like Baugruppen in Germany, that also happens here now um, in certain kind of plans, that these neighborhoods or uh, these new plans kind of function much better because they engage from the very early beginning in the planning process and the realization process already with the, 
with the citizens they will then live there, which is, yeah, it's not rocket science. It's quite obvious that this is kind of probably good if you next start this negotiation process of a kind of a neighborhood um, when you build it and not um, you and you don't start it when you when it's already built. That's right. So co-creation in that sense as well. You know? mm -hmm. There's a hand open. Yeah, I was waiting for you. Thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Simon. Yeah, okay. you can go ahead. Uh, my question is uh, actually related to the uh, previous question. Uh, when you are involved in an urban regeneration project, uh, do you take uh, do you uh, take uh, existing uh, residents of the area in consideration, uh, or, or like like in the uh, uh, participation of for the uh, decision and the decision processes prior or during the design process, uh, or do you, how do you manage? this interaction or do you have this interaction? It, we, we have this interaction often um, and it depends really on the country. Mm -hmm. um, let's say the system there, for instance, um, in, in France and in Germany without public consultation or in Great Britain, and you, you cannot plan anymore without. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you plan in Asia, um, you can imagine that this is a bit different. Um, and that they try to avoid it. But um, let's say it's, and it's always also important that there is a party, let's say locally kind of, because the, it's also something we need to, let's say we need to in, integrate always depending on this, the, the, the city or the, the country, the demand of the client or the project. But um, it's also necessary that there are people involved, they know what they need to do and kind of that this is not, um, it's not a kind of uh, um, a discussion round where you can wish whatever you want, um, so that it has to be it has to be steered very properly, you know. Um, because let's say every, always it isn't, and that but that's very often also the role in another kind of setup, even without um, let's say the, the the local residents. It's also very often as an urban planner, um, you have to say you know even between investors and the city and so forth. Or not, um, it has to. It has to work for everybody. A city is, let's say, it has to work for a bigger, bigger amount of people. So it's not only um, for a certain group, or let's say your interests as an investor have to be matched. Have to be matched with the local politics, with the local kind of, with the local demands, etc. So to bring all these different kind of um, demands together is, is part, a big part of our job, and to synthesize that, and that you do then all of it's very, very locally. But, and even in Germany, for instance, it's different where you're in the north, whether you're in the north or in the south. You know, in Berlin, without a kind of participation, such a process is not possible. Um, it, and I, but I think it's really, um, it's really good doing that. What we also, for instance, um, we have very good experiences also in, uh, in several kind of areas and countries. Um, to say you have in the early beginning, you know, if you don't know exactly where it should go to, um, then you start to, um, to to talk to different kind of interest groups, you know, separately and kind of you, you try to understand um, what the different groups want. And then you try to bring this uh, to a certain extent together. And this is very often already done also before by, let's say, the, the, the city or the municipality. And if it's not done, you have to try to do that and uh, engage with it because otherwise uh, a plan can stay just uh, paper and you put it in the paper waste. Kind of it, has to, it has to kind of get embedded, let's say, on site. With the, I said this earlier, with the people on site, otherwise it's not working. And if you don't, and there's also an interesting phenomena, um, I heard a story from if, you, if the, the city itself does not do that, Kind of at a certain certain moment, maybe even the developers kind of realize they have to do it themselves. Kind of for Kings Cross, um, I heard that at a certain point, Argent, the biggest player there, um, developer and investor, kind of realized that they have to engage um, with the, the people of Camden around because um, they saw that the ones they wanted to have in their development, um, they didn't want to come. Um, they went. They 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 found it better. They there was a, a, big, a very very well known chef kind of who went then into a kind of old industrial area and wanted to be there instead of in a new neighborhood. Kind of you need to engage with the 
that is what I also said kind of in that kind of last thesis of um, a place is always more the, the, as the someone and its elements, it's also to, to, to embed it in the context is crucial. Um, and you can only do that by um, understanding what the context and the people kind of uh, running that context uh, is. I understand there is this legal framework for participation like uh, processes in Germany, uh, but like in Turkey, we lack that. And uh, we, that's the problem that we experience here with most of the large scale urban processes, this participation is, uh, for, uh, is not seeked for. So uh, there's always a debate going on. Yeah. Yeah, but then I think it's it's interesting to ask maybe, um, I think there are, um, for instance, in Germany, um, there are so many Turkish people living and working in Germany. I also know a lot of Turkish architects and planners, you know, um, and then just uh, um, once invite one kind of as a consultant, how do, what is necessary to do, kind of what is, what is necessary to create, and we also can consult on a process like that. Um, this is, um, we do this very often, um, that is really not, it's not rocket science, it's, it's more learning from the others and understanding um, what needs to be done. And, and I think the openness to listen and to listen to the different demands and then also kind of finding a way to um, embed it in the process. Yeah. Okay. It's also not a legal issue, you know, in a way in Germany, it's not, uh, it's not, a, let's say there is not a rule or a law that we have to do kind of in a way that kind of the, if people go against the project, it, it doesn't help you. Yeah. And that is also what happened. For instance, in, even in Stuttgart, I studied in Stuttgart, like uh, you heard in the beginning, I did. I I couldn't imagine in a time when I was like that. Let's say so the, the the really established kind of bourgeoisie in in Stuttgart would go on the street to protest, but they did at a point where they said, "Kind of, you went too far now," and that kind of gives a reaction, you know, and and that is let's say wise enough. Kind of, if you plan something, you try to avoid that. Pretty simple. Costs a lot of money. <laughs> and time. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have two questions, but we are kind of running out of time. So I'm going to uh, read them uh, back to back. So I'm they're in Turkish, so I'm switching to Turkish. Ahmet Dodur'dan geliyor soru. Öncelikle sunum için çok teşekkür ediyorum. Benim şöyle bir sorum olacak. Ee, yeni eklenen yapı ile yeni kullanıcı profili gelebiliyor. Çevredeki yerel kullanıcı ve yeni gelen kullanıcı arasındaki etkileşimi kurarken nelere dikkat ediyorsunuz? Mevcut kullanıcı profilinin görüşleri bu süreçte değerlendiriliyor mu? Evet ise yerel kullanıcının bu süreçteki yeri nedir? Ee, i̇kinci soruya geçeceğim. Özlem Belir'den geliyor soru. Özellikle ülkemizdeki örneklerde kullanıcı profilinin değişimi nedeniyle oluşan olumsuzluklar bu projeler için yer seçimlerinin çok hatalı olmasından kaynaklanıyor olabilir mi? Özellikle konut alanları içindeki değişimlerin çarpıcı sonuçları olabiliyor. Evet, bu kadar. Um, the first question is clear. The second, I have to kind of then re-ask her again whether I understood it properly. The first one is, um, let's say, the, to take into account the needs and the demands of the new users that come in. That is always part of the brief you get. <laughs> that is inherent <laughs> kind of what your what what the question you get asked. Um, and then it's our kind of part of bringing in maybe how do you bring this together with what is there. Uh, because that is always kind of a developer and investor comes with a certain kind of idea of what kind of client, um, whether offices or, or, um, or residential program, what kind of clientele he wants to address. And um, the second one I didn't understand properly because um, what problem appears then kind of, I didn't understand the second question. I think you maybe have to repeat it. Okay, again because I, Tekrarlı olur. Tekrarlıyorum. 
Özellikle ülkemizdeki, yani Türkiye'yi kastediyor, örneklerde kullanıcı profilinin değişimi nedeniyle oluşan olumsuzluklar bu projeler için yer seçimlerinin hatalı olmasından kaynaklanıyor olabilir mi? Özellikle konut alanları içindeki değişimlerin çarpıcı sonuçları olabiliyor. Bir örnek vermiş, onu da ekliyorum. Örneğin sığınmacıların yerleştiği bir bölgeye kültür merkezi ve benzeri projeler yapmak. Demiş Özlem Belir. Yes, yeah, so sure. that is kind of we were working once also on, um, let's say, strategies of, let's say, the, the integrated planning, integration planning for refugee settlements. And I think the question is, I think there, um, what kind of social groups or let's say new social habits kind of are addressed? And probably they are also very often mono only in one direction. And if you look, um, because you should also look to spread kind of, let's say to try, for instance, refugees. Um, we had kind of strategies to a certain kind of planners at the time, but politically it was not wish. How do you integrate refugees into existing neighborhoods and also communities? And how do you build, let's say that there is a certain inclusion and how do you, and not putting all of them in the same place. Um, first of all, kind of link them also to maybe neighborhoods that are kind of um, more affine and also looking then to what are their needs. Sure, they don't need, for instance, and what kind of different cultures are there in and how do you group them again? Kind of where, where is an affinity and where is that there's a kind of um, maybe more uh, that they cannot, uh, let's say, even cultural, culturally kind of have problems with each other because they come from kind of competing kind of cultures, you know? Um, or completely that deferring kind of cultures. And I think there you have to really very, very carefully look how, what you bring together. And I think um, if, if there's a development and it sounds a bit this question like development that there is one investor or developer likes to have a certain kind of clientele somewhere. And then you put them in, put these in a, in a big group. This is always leads always to problems. Because it's also socially a mono, mono function, mono functional kind of a mono programmatic kind of a approach. And I think this, this hybridization or radical mix has to be has to be addressed on all different kind of aspects. Mm -hmm. Finding also there a mix of, 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 of uh, social groups, because if you do that, there is also the social control among each other. If 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 you don't, um, you 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 always get, um, let's say, an extreme of one in each direction. Does this answer a bit the question? Okay, she says thank you. <laughs> I think you answered it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we don't have any more questions uh, right now. We're, you know, um, we can wrap up our event because we are, uh, you know, running out of time. Uh, I will share my screen for a bit. Thank you very much for okay. all questions uh, and also for your listening. And uh, thank you once again for the invitation. Thank you. I was just going to say that. <laughs> so, um, we can wrap up our event. Uh, I'd like to thank Utse Schneider as well for the expertise she has shared with us today. Uh, and um, I'd like to thank another person, which is uh, Elias Dar. This conference could not have happened without the coordination uh, of our jury representative, Elias. Thank you for your support. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to thank our uh, sponsor of this special event, Arginolo and Çalışlar Architects. Um, so that's everything I need to point on. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Uh, you must say, maybe, or Elias, I can give the word to you as well, if you like. Yes, would be nice. Yes. 
Yes, uh, yeah. just, uh, thank you, uh, all the team from Aura Istanbul, um, for the organization of this event. It was really interesting, and I want to thank uh, Ute Schneider um, yeah, for your interest in uh, holding this lecture. It was really a very fascinating and interesting thing. Also, for the, the topic is uh, really interesting uh, for the uh, actual uh, semester program of our Istanbul at the moment. So I think uh, everyone um, yeah, can profit of this uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, are you based in Zurich or are you? Yeah, I'm based in Zurich. Ah. Then once pass, thank you very much. Then once pass by in the office, kind of go for a drink at the river bar in, in Newt's, kind of would be nice. Yeah, would be nice. Yeah, and um, just give a sign. No, thank you. And I think it's it's the topic is not only for the semester. I think the topic is, in my opinion, or in our opinion, really relevant for also um, our profession, whether urbanists or architects or um, in, involved within development, um, because. We really need to look into what I said earlier, um, what, do, what, what do we have already built and how can we transform that and give that new life? Um, because we should not build too much new or let's say, or then refurbish, but kind of where, only, only where there is already something built and densify on that. That is one thing. And it is on one hand, and that's the reason why I think it's so important to understand that, that there's also a reason why churches upon churches upon churches kind of were built on kind of the same place. There's a reason for that. And I think that will also save some kind of land take um, on one hand, but also bring much, much more lively and vibrant kind of areas uh, in. And then we also go much uh, really reuse, let's say what we all have already have built will also save a lot of CO2 emissions. Um, using this great gray energy that is already in helps a lot. And I think it's on all levels. I think these are the, the, the questions we have to face the, 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 the next decennia and uh, um, to, to really try to get climate neutral. Um, and therefore seeing this on all levels um, and the quality or the, 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 yeah, the chance in it, in a, in a way, I think is, these are the questions of the uh, us and the, the, the next generation kind of, we really need to be careful what we do with the with heritage, but also with our globe and, and, and soil. And what it's maybe as a, as a word at the end, because let's say heritage, and that's something maybe that is very, very Dutch, is also kind of also a new program for maybe buildings that were kind of had a completely different use. And um, there is a famous kind of chess club and concert hall in Amsterdam, um, Paradiso, that is in an old church. If there is no, program that doesn't need to be per se only a museum or a church kind of, there can also be another completely different program that is productive, um, residential kind of in some heritage buildings if they are not used. We, we should not be too careful. Let's say they also keep a lot of heritage buildings, but kind of some, some things once in a while also have then maybe to go for a better use um, and you keep parts of it or you fill it in different with different kind of program. I think that is the that is the way um, we should look at this um, to be sensible and climate neutral as much as possible. Thanks a lot. And yeah, it would be really nice. Thanks for the support and it would be really nice to see you once in person. And visiting once Istanbul again would be also nice. Yeah, yeah that's uh, what looking I was forward going to, to seeing you here in Istanbul. As our <laughs> yeah, guest. We, would, we, would, we would like to show you our, uh, the patina of the art. Uh, of our old city, where yes. also uh, our physical spaces actually. I yeah. hope hopefully, after the pandemic, that we can create that opportunity. Yeah, Thank yeah, it would so. be nice. I think there's a lot uh, to, lot interesting to do. Yeah, great. That was lovely. We did have a, some projects at the moment, not, but uh, for sure, why not? Sure. Nice. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay.